Hey, hello, this is Steve Kibler here at Dr. S.W. Kibler Ministries. Thank you again for joining me for this installment of The Cosmic Bible, God's Word for Today and Beyond. And this particular series we're looking at is Eternity from There and Back Again. This is God's plan through the ages, a supernatural conflict. So we have been looking at age four out of the three that we have previously covered. Now we're at age four, and here is kind of where we are. Uh, we're here, here at the bottom, and this is man under promise. Now we've covered some other ones. Uh, here's that uh, second graphic that I provide for you so you can take a look. It's kind of a guide of where we've been and where we're going. But we have uh, been looking at the age four of man under promise and the main character has been Abram. Now this is video 17, age four, man under promise. This is part four. So what we have seen, uh, as well as Abram and those with him, there have been uh, some interesting characters that we have been introduced to, such as the kings that inhabited the land of Canaan and the kings from across the Jordan River. Remember, there was a great battle, great wars there. And then the various tribes of maybe what we might say not quite so human beings that we have looked at. And we've also realized that there was great turmoil and conflict uh, that was present in that land, the land of Canaan. It not, wasn't only the wars between these earthly kings and kingdoms, but also of spiritual entities and kingdoms that are opposed to Yahweh Elohim and that spiritual war that raged and is still raging today. And not just in the land of Canaan, but even here in our United States. Spiritual warfare is raging and many don't see it. It just goes unnoticed. But these spiritual entities that are opposed to Yahweh Elohim, the Lord God, motivated these other peoples in the land of Canaan, and there was conflict and chaos, and they're still at work today here. Now, the reality, we're looking at this man under promise. Now, the, the reality of the promise that the Lord God made to Abram, it's significant in one way, because in fulfilling the promise, at least from a human perspective, it was not going to be an easy ordeal. We have seen and looked at the problems that existed in that land that was promised to Abram. And it was beyond Abram's ability to subdue the land himself. As a matter of fact, Abram won't see that land subdued. Uh, that will come later. But the belief that Abram had was not because it was a, a because it was feasible humanly or because it was an easy thing that, that the Lord was promising. Abram believed the Lord because he knew, believed that Yahweh Elohim was able to keep the promise that he made. Abram's belief, faith, was in Yahweh Elohim, the Lord, not in anything else. And that is exactly what our faith is supposed to be in today as well. Our faith, our belief, is not to be in a belief system. Our faith is not to be in a religion. Our faith is not to be in a church. Our faith is not to be in an ideology. Our faith is not to be in a political party. Our faith is to be in the one and only true, most high God, Yahweh Elohim, who made the promise. Because he is able to do exactly what he promised to do. Okay? So, Let's look at Genesis now in chapter 15. I hope this is working, right? So uh, bear with me. I'm using some uh, uh, new program here. 
and I hope that it works out just fine. So this is Genesis chapter 15. I'll begin reading with verse 1. This is English Standard Version. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield, your reward uh, shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord, what will you give me? For I continue to be childless in the heir of my house as a leaser of Damascus, who was one of his servants. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. Now, whenever it says the word of the Lord, this is just a little bit aside. We're not going to go down this rabbit hole. But when it says the word of the Lord came to him, the word of the Lord is not a sound. The word of the Lord is the person of Yahweh Elohim. It refers to him. It was some type of vis a visual manifestation of the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim. The word of the Lord came to him. He's not that he heard something only. It wasn't thought to put in his head, but it was an encounter with Yahweh Elohim himself. Now, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Uh, your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars. If you are able to number them, then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. So I just want to go back and touch on this, that the word of the Lord refers to the person of Yahweh Elohim, the Lord God. Look at why. It says, the word of the Lord came to Abram. And now in verse 5, it says, and he brought him outside and said, look towards it. So the one who was speaking brought Abram outside. This was a visible manifestation of Yahweh Elohim, of Yahweh, of the Lord God. So then it says, if you are able to number them, look at the heavens, look at the stars, number the stars, if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Six. And he believed the Lord. And he, the Lord, counted it to him as righteousness. Now, after these things refers to all that we have covered in, in the, the past uh, three presentations and some that we haven't. And one of the things we didn't really look at too closely was what happened with Lot after the warring kings from across the Jordan took Lot and uh, his family and the people from Sodom and Gomorrah and took them captive. What the scripture tells us is that Abram took around 300, I think it's 318 of his trained men, and they went and conquered all the kings that had just conquered all the land. And they brought Lot and all the people back safely and everything. So that was one thing. Another thing that we didn't look at was at that time, right after he rescued Lot, was a meeting with a unique individual named Melchizedek king of Salem. And we read about that here in Genesis 14, 18 through 20. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hands. Now, why I want to mention that, and we're not going to dig deep into this right now. We will look at it later. Uh, the other time that Melchizedek is mentioned is in the New Testament. So we're just going to wait and um, pick up this later. But what I want to mention about this now is because it relates to the promise, and it will be important when we later look at the children of Israel as they leave captivity in Egypt. And it's this, Melchizedek was a priest of the God Most High, which indicates there was knowledge of the truth of Yahweh Elohim in the land of Canaan because Salem later became Jerusalem. Okay, So it, the king of Salem was king of what would later be known as Jerusalem. 
So there was other than Abram that knew the truth, that knew about Yahweh Elohim, the God Most High. And it seems this priest king, priest king, Melchizedek, had information about Abram and the promise the Lord had made to him. Now, it might seem trivial, but we need to realize that the promise made to Abram by the Lord God was not made to Israel and was not made to the Jews because neither existed at the time. The promise, however, would affect all of humanity. All of humanity. And this is stated in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. And it says, this is the call of Abram. Now the Lord God said, Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you may be a blessing. I will bless those that bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be in all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Not just not just his descendants, right? But all families of the earth. That's everyone. <laughs> everyone would be blessed. So the key phrase here is all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And that includes you and me today. That's how far reaching this promise is. It reaches into the future to touch our present and even beyond our own contemporary time frame. It's an immense promise that we will touch on uh, further all the way through the rest of these uh, the study. So the key phrase is all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And that includes you and me today. So the promise made to Abraham was in effect to all peoples, right? And the Melchizedek knew of this, and he knew of the truth, and he blessed Abram. All right, so we're going to go back to Genesis chapter 15 now. And it, it reads this way. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. That's the uh, English Standard Version. What's interesting to look at is it says, fear not, or don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Now, what that tells us is there was much to fear in the land of Canaan. Abram was surrounded by the enemies of Yahweh Elohim, and therefore, also, they were his potential enemies, Abram's potential enemies. You see, Abram is listed as a man of faith because he trusted the Lord God not because things would be easy and uneventful. And that's basically what Yeshua tells us in John 15, verse 18 through 19. Again, English Standard Version. It says, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world... But I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. That's exactly what happened with Abram. The Lord chose him out and made a promise to him. Therefore, Abram would be hated and his descendants would be hated as well. But it applies to those who the Lord has called out of this world, which I am one of those that included. The Lord has called me out of this world. I do not belong to the world. I belong to Yahweh Elohim. I belong to Yeshua. I belong to the Lord God. And as I live and reflect as my Savior, I know the world will hate me. It's not an easy path, is it? We don't become saved. We don't accept Christ so things can be easy. We need to realize that when we accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, when Yeshua, when Yahweh Elohim pulls us out of this world and makes us his own, 
the world will hate us. And if the world isn't hating us, then we're not living the way that we should. It's that simple. So this truth that uh, uh, the Lord told to Abraham says, fear not, it applies to us too. Because things aren't always easy. The next portion of this section of the biblical text, we're going to read and I'm going to talk about it a little bit. Uh, and I'm going to use two different versions other than the English Standard Version. And I'm going to use the New International Version and then the King James Version. So this is uh, New International Version, Chapter 15, Genesis. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. The King James Version reads, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceedingly great reward. So, we've looked at Abram was not to be afraid, not to fear, because Yahweh Elohim was his shield. There was a measure of protection, a protection that everything would work out according to the Lord's plan, even when it didn't look like it was working out. Nothing would overcome the Lord. And as long as Abraham stood behind the Lord, the shield, Abram would be okay. Now, this also applies to us today. Listen, this is John 16, 33. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have, what? Tribulation. Here's a promise. You want to rest upon the promises of God? We always say that as Christians and we hear that in truth. Standing on the promises. Well, here's a promise from Yeshua himself. In the world you will have tribulation. Boom. Take it to heart. Accept it. Understand it. In this world, you will have tribulation. But take heart. Some versions say, but fear not. But take heart. I, Yeshua, have overcome the world. You see, it's not that there won't be difficult times. Everything isn't going to come up roses. The promise the Lord has made to those that are his is you will have tribulations, difficult times, chaos in this life, but don't fear. I have overcome the world. That world order that is opposed to the Lord God. Okay. The lack of difficult times is not a sign of blessing necessarily. Right? The lack of difficult times is not a sign that you're being blessed necessarily. If you're walking with the Lord, you will face difficult times because the world hates you. Those forces, entities, spiritual beings that are opposed to the Lord God, they hate you too. Because it hates him. And they can't take it out on him except taking it out on those who are his. But don't fear. Don't fear. Expect it, but don't fear. The Lord is your shield. You stay behind the Lord. Now, look at this next part. What is the reward? What is the reward? Is it easy times? No. Is it fame? No. Now, the Lord promised that the Lord would bless Abram, but Abram's going to have some difficult times. The Lord said he would make him uh, well known in a, a nation out of him. But is that the reward? No, that's what the Lord said he was going to do. So it's not fame and fortune. Is it prestige? Although Abram would have prestige, that was something the Lord was going to do. But is that the reward? No, that's not the reward for faith, for belief. That's not the reward. Look at it. It says, what is the great reward? It says, Abram, I am your shield and your 
great reward. Yahweh, Elohim, is the great reward. Don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your very great reward. The Lord is the reward. Wrap your heads around that. The Lord is the reward. It's not other things. It's the Lord himself. There is nothing more. That's what we just, in this world, they have tribulation. Fear not, I have overcome the world. You have the Lord. That's all you need. That's all you need to face anything that you will encounter in this life. It's the Lord. It may be difficult. It may be trying. It may be chaotic. But you have the Lord. That is all you need. The Lord is the reward. There is nothing higher to seek than the Lord and the Lord alone. You see, many people walk through this life, and many Christians, right? They walk through this life, and they're looking for something else. They're looking for something more, right? Way they, they, people claim to be his, they claim to be uh, Christian, they attend the appropriate gatherings, a church, worship service, praise worship services. But to make things easier in this life, to get along, right? Many Christians compromise. They compromise God's word. In contemporary life, we are being taught to accept, overlook, not comment, and never confront those things that are now normalized in our society and culture that the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, considers as evil, as wrong, as detestable, as abominable. We're told not to even confront those things. And the church seems, Christ, Christendom at least, seems to be accepting and tolerating these things. We attempt to make our walk in this world as easy as possible, so we accept and even practice things that are abhorrent to Yahweh Elohim. And often we do this out of fear, fear of rejection, fear of ridicule, right? Because we want things to be easier. Because walking the walk, not just talking the talk, but walking the walk, is not easy. And it doesn't mean that things are going to be easy for you if you're talking the talk and walking the walk. But people look for that. That's what they want. And a lot of times that's what they expect from the Lord is easy times, prosperity. That's what they consider blessings, right? But that's not the reality. And so people start accepting the world so they can get along with the world, so they're not rejected, so they're not ridiculed. And a lot of times that's out of fear, fear of rejection, fear of ridicule. But listen, don't fear. Don't fear. Follow the Lord. Get behind him. He is your shield as well. Now we're going to continue with Genesis chapter 15, and this is going to be 7 through 17, and I am just going to read it because it's rather lengthy, okay? So again, English Standard Version, Genesis 15, uh, 7 through 17. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur from the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord, how am I to uh, know that I shall possess it? And he said to him, Bring me heifer, three years old, female goat, three years old a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. So he put them with a little path in between them, right? And he laid each half over against the other, but he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down to feast on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. So as the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for four hundred years. 
but I will bring judgment on that nation that they serve. And afterward, they shall come out with, a, with great possessions. As for you, Abram, you shall go to your fathers in peace, and you shall be buried in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down, and it was dark. Behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. It's a beautiful section of the biblical text, isn't it? It's imperative that we recognize that the promises of God, the covenant promises that he makes, there's always death or the shedding of blood. This promise, this covenant that we just read in Genesis 15 is no different. These animals had to give their lives, shed their blood, to seal the promise. That's very gravitas, isn't it? That's, that's very heavy, very weighty. The animals, in the vast majority of instances in the biblical text, replace a human being or replace humanity. That they replace an individual person. The death of an animal represents the death of the individual. And this is a very solemn promise. You see, the Lord made the promise. The Lord made the promise. And it's the very existence of the Lord that keeps the promise intact. If the Lord would cease to exist, the promise would would cease to exist as well. The animals died, but the Lord lives forever. This is a very solemn promise. It reminds us in Romans chapter 6, verses 4 through 7, as we were buried therefore with him by immersion into death, in order that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in death, like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. You see, we believe in a promise. And it's basically the same promise that Abram believed. That through his offspring, all peoples would be blessed. And that offspring, that seed, is Yeshua, is Jesus Christ. But the promise of Yeshua was sealed by the shedding of blood and his death. So back to chapter 15 of Genesis. Let's see here. Chapter 15, and he believed the Lord. He, Abram, believed the Lord. He believed the Lord. That's the object of his belief. The Lord is his object of belief. It wasn't the outcomes, right? It wasn't the religion or the beliefs. Or it was the Lord. He believed the Lord. That's where he put his trust. He believed the Lord. And because of that, the Lord counted it to Abram as righteousness. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. Abram believed the Lord would do everything that he promised. Now, we know this. God says what he means. He means what he says. And he did and will do everything that he said he was going to do. It's all about the Lord. It's all about the Lord. And that is in whom we put our faith. 
Remember, it's not a belief system, not a church, not a religion, not an ideology. No, it's not that. It's not about us. And it's not about the amount of faith we have. Because even the faith to believe doesn't come from within us. It comes from the Lord himself. Ephesians tells us, For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works. It's not a man. Even the ability to believe, to place faith in Yahweh Elohim, in Yeshua, does not come from within the individual. It's a gift that's tagged onto us that when then we respond to it. But it's all about the Lord. It's not ever, ever, ever about us. Abram believed the Lord he would do everything he promised, and we believe the Lord that he will do everything he promised. We are a people under promise. So now we read in, in Galatians uh, chapter 3, verses 23 through 29. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many as you were immersed into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abram's offspring, heirs according to promise. Bingo. There we go. That ties this promise, this age, uh, man under promise, with where we are today. We are a people under promise. The same promise that was made to Abram is made to us, and we must respond the same way. We must believe the Lord, Yahweh Elohim, Yeshua. We're living under the same promise. And we'll develop that a little further as we move on. But what we don't want to miss out on is an important piece of prophecy uh, that will lead us to the next age. It's time to move on. Age five, man under law. Genesis 15, we read this. Then the Lord said to Abraham, know for certain, this is 15 verse 13, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and they will be servants or slaves there. And they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. This is the word of Yahweh, that Abram's descendants will spend four generations as slaves. It'll be about 430 years. And we know where that is. Specifically, it will be in Egypt. But they will come back to the promised land. Now, look at Abram asked the Lord, but how do I know that I will possess the land, that you'll give it to me and my descendants? They went through that covenant process with the the animals and the, the that whole procedure that the Lord was making a covenant with Abram. And this is what the Lord told Abram. You won't see it, but I'll make it happen. You won't see it from here, but I'll make it happen. You need to know your descendants, they're going to be slaves for four generations in a foreign land. He said, but I'm going to bring judgment on that nation, and I'm going to bring the people here. And they will come back to the promised land. Isn't that interesting? See, things don't always make sense to us as we read them in the biblical text, does it? It doesn't always make sense. But the Lord always has his reasons. And we must remember, as it tells us in Isaiah, chapter 55, verses 8 through 9. The Lord is speaking, right? He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Dude, just think about that for a minute. The Lord says his thoughts are not your thoughts. But a lot of times, that's the way we want it to be. We want the Lord to think the way we do. 
And often that's a lot how we pray too. We pray with our thoughts saying, Lord, why don't you do this for me? Because this is the way I think it would be better. But the Lord says, hey, you don't think the way I do. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. And I'd say, good. I'd rather have the Lord's thoughts. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. You see, we want God to work in our life the way we want him to work. But the Lord says, your ways are not his ways. So allow the Lord to work his way, even if it doesn't make sense. Let the Lord accept the Lord. Acknowledge the Lord. Notice the Lord as he works his way in your life. Don't expect him to work your way. Expect the Lord to work his way. That's why it's important to have a biblical world view. Because we look at humanity today. We look at the situation on planet Earth today. And it is in chaos. It is in turmoil. Right? It is. And people ask, why doesn't God do this? Why doesn't God do that? Why doesn't God do that? Because that's not God's ways. That's not God's ways. That's not his plan. It's not his thoughts. And it's not his ways. We need to see God's ways. Then we can understand what's happening in the world around us in our own lives. Listen, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The Lord has made a promise. We believe the Lord. Don't put your trust in what someone else thinks, and don't put your trust in what you think. Because the Lord's thoughts are not yours. Don't look for the things in this world to go your way. Because your way is not the Lord's. Look for things to go the Lord's way. And give him credit for the things that are happening. Even situations that seem chaotic, conflicting, and devastating. Allow the Lord to work his way. And remember, fear not. Fear not. Because you know the truth. You stand on the truth. And now speak the truth. God bless you.